heat wave. It's been, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been crazy and, and cold snap. And we're finally sort of getting back to the point where like, I, I look out, I look outside my window. We're live, by the way, I look outside my window and I see like parts of the ground again. And I just call them like patches of freedom where I can start to walk around on the ground again, which will be really great. I'm really looking forward. I'm really looking forward to that. All right. Well, we started. So uh, the question I always ask people is, who are you and what do you do? Well, I am a radio astronomer. I'm working at Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn. And uh, what we do uh, most of the days is just very long baseline interferometry. So uh, radio observations at highest uh, resolution. No, I no, I think I mean a lot of people are very familiar with this idea of very long baseline interferometry, and that's probably made most famously by the Event Horizon Telescope, fairly recently. So, how does interferometry work? Well, it's just an, an old idea of the two slits where you put two slits and the wave comes through these two slits, it forms an interferometric one different interference pattern. And the uh, interesting idea is that if you can combine these signals, and if you can decipher them, you can get uh, um, an effective feeling as if your lens was actually of the size of the distance between the two slits. Mm -hmm. so, it is possible to do this kind of two slit experiments and in, uh, in many uh, different um, physical settings in optical and radio but in the radio you can actually record the full information of the incoming wave front you can recall it could record voltages which you, which means the amplitudes and and the phase of the ball of the uh, of the voltage and because of that you can actually restore this image uh, very accurately or reconstruct a telescope mm -hmm. with an effective diameter which is the largest distance between two antennas and uh, since we actually can record at each antenna that full incoming wave front then we can store this recording and bring them together in uh, in a special settings in the correlator facility and then play against each other with with appropriate delays and we'll find the correlated signal correlations we find that we reconstruct that double speed experiment in some some ways and then what happens is, is a very nice thing so basically by placing antennas on the opposite side of the earth we can have an effective telescope with a diameter of 12,000 kilometers hmm. or in this case in this in case of this image one of the antennas was actually orbiting antenna and it was uh, flying as far away from the Earth as probably almost the distance to the moon, 300,000 kilometers. And uh, since we uh, the recording and detection uh, detectors are so sensitive, we could actually make that double slit experiments or the recordings of the um, uh, correlations almost all the way up to 300,000 wow. kilometers. That's amazing. So, now we're going to talk more about this image in a second, but I but I want to just give like like my audience is really excited about the idea of interferometry, and you know I've talked about it quite a lot about you get a telescope that's the equivalent of the separation of the telescopes, you get a higher resolution, but you don't necessarily get you don't get more um, light gathering, you just get the you just get the, the resolution. So you need to look at very bright objects. But why does it work? And I may be if I'm like, I may be afraid that I'm even asking this question. But why can why does separating two telescopes and aligning them to the point that they're essentially at the same wavelength? Why does that act like a telescope with a baseline between them? Um, well, this is a bit of mathematics, basically, by, 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 that's why I said I, I was afraid to ask, but, but I, you know, probably not, not easy to, ex not easy to explain it with just hand waving, but what's <laughs> going to happen is, <laughs> is that for each, well, we have this idea of, of, uh, making Fourier transform of the, uh, of the images. And what we do is in fact, we, 
measure that Fourier transform in real life by uh, combining signals from two antennas or multiple antennas. And each pair of antennas samples just one particular spectral harmonic of that Fourier transform of the, uh, of the um, uh, picture, say the galaxy. Uh, so by placing many antennas at different places and, and by using the rotation of the Earth so that the orientation of the, uh, each pair of the antennas actually changes with respect to the direct and direction to the source which we observe. We can sample many different harmonics of that Fourier uh, spectrum or Fourier decomposition of the, uh, of the image. And then we do in the inverse calculation. From those samples, we calculate the true image, how it should, how it should look. And that's, that's essentially why it is working. But this is interference. That's, that's what the uh, mathematically or conceptually, what is what it does. So essentially, if you measure correlation of the incoming wavefront measured at two different distant points. If you measure the correlation between these between these signals, you effectively measure just one uh, spectral harmonic of that Fourier transform of the uh, of the image on the in the sky. And the more of these measurements you can actually make, the better will be than the the result of your inverse calculation when you calculate the uh, true brightness distribution or image of the uh, right. object. Um, and, and, and so why, like, I know with radio waves, you can do a more effective, you can do it, it's easier, I guess, in radio waves than it is in in other wavelengths. Why is that? Um, well, it's because, again, to, to record that incoming wavefront, you need sufficient, sufficient bandwidth, sufficient speed of recording in order to be able to sample that wave incoming wave right and that sampling gets progressively more difficult if you go to shorter wavelengths so by the time we arrive uh, frequencies of many many terahertz which is not even yet the optical frequency um, it becomes very much difficult with the present day uh, recording systems so when you come to the optical uh, telescopes in optical interferometry you cannot anymore record the phase or mm -hmm. sample if you're coming away from so you do some uh, more simplistic uh, settings essentially you just basically you change the length of the optical channel between the two telescopes so find that fringe we find that interferometric response by change by gradually adjusting the uh, the uh, path lengths between the two uh, light rays coming from different from different telescopes and still that's then Again, the phase information, the phase of the incoming wave is completely lost there or very difficult to recover. And that's why radio astronomy is in its wonderful advantage, advantages position where you can do uh, uh, the full reconstruction of the uh, or, uh, recording of the incoming wave from. Like if I have a radio telescope in Canada and you have a radio telescope telescope in Germany, and we both have a very accurate atomic clock and we record we we agree to record at the same time, we can then take the hard drives that are the all of the data, line them up for time, and sort of go back in time to rebuild that telescope as if it was aligned. But as you're saying with the with the visible ones, it's the I guess the the wavelengths are so small that you have to do it in real time. You've essentially got to take two optical telescopes, have their light interfere with each other to the point that you know you've got it down to a few nanometers, and now your telescopes are aligned perfectly. But there's no way to do that after the fact. Do I, is that right? Yes, yes, that's correct. That's so. It's again, we are very lucky that we can actually store that wavefront and then process it sometimes years later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I mean, we saw that with the Event Horizon Telescope, where they flew giant hard drives around, took them to processing centers and spent the better part of like two years crunching the numbers to finally come down to the final image of the of the Event Horizon Telescope. What is the limit for doing this after the fact using a 
good clock and lots of data and lots of computing resource? Where where would you not want to try that and shift to real time? Um, well, as as soon as you're not able again, not able to record the incoming waveforms, you're in trouble. So mm -hmm. you have to do it in real time. And uh, what we do now, well, the limit is um, okay. There's there are many. Uh, technicalities and problems with the phase uh, stability uh, by when you go to uh, progressively shorter wavelengths. At the moment, what we can do is, well, the Event Horizon Telescope does it at 230 gigahertz, which okay. is, uh, uh, what is it, 1.3 millimeter. Okay. And then we can go to uh, 345 gigahertz, which is 0.7 millimeter. That's about the highest frequency at which the VOBI on the interferometry has, has been tried detected these interferometric responses between a couple of antennas. And indeed, the NGHT, I'm also working on that part of the uh, interferometry, NGHT, or the next generation of the um, EH, next reincarnation or generation of the EHT observations, are planning actually to go to uh, 345 gigahertz. There are also plans to uh, do some even higher frequencies from space, but it is. Uh, very far away at the moment. Right. It's just just the initial ideas to really yeah. perform the measurements. And so then let's so then let's compare and contrast then the I mean the the news that I saw from out of your group kind of blew my mind and I'm I'm surprised it wasn't a bigger story. And I've I'm I feel like I'm the only person who's talking about this, which is quite surprising to me was because you took the same idea of using the event horizon telescope, but to image a supermassive black hole, but you added a spacecraft to that network. And so while well, the event horizon telescope is just a virtual telescope, the size of planet Earth, you as you say, you added a, a spacecraft that was almost dis the distance to the moon. And now suddenly you've got a telescope that is vastly bigger. So sort of can you compare just like how how was your this virtual telescope, this radio telescope compared to the Event Horizon telescope? Um, there are two things essentially. So you we have a resolution, formal angular resolution, which is like two times better than the Event Horizon telescope. So it's ten micro arc seconds, ten millions of an arc second. Yeah. Uh, Event Horizon is about twenty. But uh, we observe at much lower frequency. That uh, here is at 22 gigahertz, so 1.3, so 10 times lower frequency, essentially. Uh, which means then, if we're talking about uh, black holes, uh, then we're going to be more affected by scattering and absorption of the emission that comes from the very inner part or the very scales of comparable to the event horizon scale. So for as for these observations, it could be opaque, essentially, or scattered. In this case, it's just just opacity in this case of, of this particular source. Uh, but um, again, this this is a, uh, a telescope which is on, on was on board of the uh, Russian satellite Radio Astron, which was launched in 2011, and uh, we're still processing the data again, <laughs> using our luck. Um, uh, so. This telescope has ended its operations in 2019, and uh, so this is the last remaining bits of the of the data. And it's luckily for us, one of those observations actually again set a new world record on the angular resolution. Was was this planned? Like, was it planned in advance that you're going to be gathering all this data and using the the image from the the Russian satellite or were, was this something you were able to do after the fact? No, no, of course, it's a, it's a long time project. Yeah. In, in fact, in fact, when I was doing my master's thesis in 1990, uh, I was told that my model, my little model would be applied to the data from from that satellite from Radio Astro. And it took it after that, it took it 21 years to, uh, to wow. actually build so all those years, we just we did something with just preparations and everything. So it's a very much uh, long time uh, effort, and the effort scattered across the globe. This collaboration is actually essentially uh, radio astronomers all over the place, hmm. from Australia to Canada, U.S., Europe, uh, 
And, and so you gathered your data before the Event Horizon telescope. Yes, but right. is, have only but been able to finish yeah, yeah. the computation now. Um, well, because the um, to correlate to perform this correlation, it is not easy. Yeah, to to calibrate the data, it's also not easy. Uh, to image them is also not quite easy. And then to analyze and perform physical modeling is another task. And we're a small, relatively small group of people. So essentially, uh, what, what happens is that we have for this telescope, for this, for radio astro, there were three major key science programs uh, focused on different aspects of AGM. Uh, that's because that's at this frequency. That's so, active galactic nuclei. Active galactic nuclei. Yeah. Um, so we processing gradually, coming to actually to uh, to a close with this processing, all the data, all the imaging experiments which were uh, obtained with radio astro. This is one of this is probably um, well, it's a second or third. No, this, there are many several PRs um, about uh, different uh, imaging um, results. But this is this is probably just the recent one, the most recent one. Right, um, and so. Um, I, I, I sort of like did the math at one point on what the resolution of say the event horizon telescope was. And it was the equivalent of, I think, um, like about two thirds of a meter, like holding your hands two thirds of a meter apart on the international space station and it being able to resolve that it was, as you said, it's like about 20, um, micro mill arc seconds. Micro, micro, no, micro, micro arc seconds. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so for you, your resolution is half that. Your resolution is like, you know, like a foot um, measured uh, on a person holding, you know. A... No, I, think, I think it's actually better. Uh, oh. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah, no, I, see, that's the thing. So so my math is that, it, or what I had researched is that it was 60 was the batter, was the Event Horizon Telescope, and you were down to 12? We have yeah twelve micro arc seconds. Yeah. But, uh, our standard standard thing is that ten micro arc seconds. It's essentially uh, what is it? A dollar coin on the on the surface of the moon. It's much better than what you think. It's a, what it is. <laughs> That's incredible. That's amazing. All right. Um, all right. So then let's talk about the the actual work that you did. So what was the target of your observation? So this is a. Um, one of the uh, famous active galactic nuclei, and it's famous, it has become famous because what was noticed is that it has a very much, a very strongly periodical outburst. The activity, which was traced in the uh, using the optical observations all the way to the um, beginning of the 20th century, and they found out that basically this object, as it undergoes through a series of sort of double outbursts, every roughly every 12 years so you can hmm. align them back they try they try to look for the optical plates and every uh, records that were available for this part of the sky and found out that even in the uh, at the beginning of the 20th century you still have this sort of double outbursts and people get puzzled by that and then they wanted to um, uh, try to model that with some sensible scenario and the uh, the one that actually survived and the one that is most popular now is that in this object we have a binary black hole, hmm. um, such that the secondary black hole is much has a uh, much smaller mass. Uh, I forgot, I think three or three percent, or even three three thousand point three percent of the uh, of the primary black hole, and therefore, when the when it orbits the, the primary, it does not destroy the accretion disk around the primary. So the jets and this activity uh, requires that you have material created onto a black hole, organized in a disk, and then some sort of a rotation of the, of the disk forms some dyna a dynamo effect, enhances magnetic fields, and then collimates plasma into a narrow cone bipolar outflows. This is, this is what jets are, right? And uh, if you have a secondary black hole, it is very likely that when, when it approaches the primary, it will disturb the whole system and the accretion disk may become unstable or disappear completely. In this case, we would not be able to observe uh, these um, beams of relativistic plasma, the jets. Um, but since the secondary black hole in these objects is much less massive, 
it does not destroy the disc it just goes through it on each approach <laughs> twice uh -huh. and every time it pierces the disc uh you get an outflow um, flare you get an sort of explosive events and then you see it as an as a flare in the optical light curve and since this is a binary system then the um, it's the best sort of clocks that we have in the universe it's either rotation of a pulsar or a you know, or orbital motion those are the most accurate processes or uh, strictly repeating processes and in this case um they could model it in to such a degree of accuracy that they say that they basically they even detect the relativistic effects so the precession of the of the orbit of the secondary um <clears throat> And that's, bas that's basically brought a lot of interest to studies of this source. What we hope is that um, we may even be able to detect the emission from the secondary eventually. Wow. Uh, this, this object, I'm going a bit ahead of, the, ahead of time, is also observed or has been observed with the uh, with EHT. And now we're processing the next set of data with radio astro, so the space will be I observations and EHT observations. Actually, we're taken at uh, concurrently or almost simultaneously, quite simultaneously in, in time. So that's what we hope is to see how this hyp hypothetical binary system uh, could be either revealed or kind of would, would affect or would affect the, uh, the emission on such small scales. And we may see that effect because the, you see that the bending of the, uh, of the structures increases as you progressively come to the base of the self flow which should be right right above the accretion disk of a, of a primary uh, black hole. Um, the trouble for us is that, of course, if you want to um, uncover this physics of a binary system, you also have to observe it, uh, this object for repeatedly and for quite a long period of time. If the period is 12 years, you have to sample quite a good deal of that period in order to be able to see any type of changes which would indicate that that evolution, but VLBI, um, it's a very, very ex much expensive instrument, and it's very difficult to organize these kind of measurements because it's, all the telescopes are actually doing many other things, and then uh, VLBI sessions or observations they usually happen uh, quite um, uh, not so often. So, and you cannot basically say, okay, now I'm going to observe this object for a year and a half and forget right. about everything. So get in line. Right, right. Um, and so and so what were you able to confirm then with with your observations? Like, were you able to confirm that this second object is a black hole passing through the accretion disk of this larger black hole? Were you able to sort of do you feel like you're able to confirm that? Unfortunately, not. Unfortunately, not. But again, um, we hope to be able to uh, perhaps detect this black hole with more sensitive observations, if it is there. Because, well, it could be that there's very, very strangely periodic events in the uh, single accretion disk. It is difficult to imagine. You have to uh, have some extremely strong magnetic fields, which would basically freeze this disk in certain certain state and then would get um, repeating patterns. I don't know. It's very difficult to imagine that you will get that. Let me say it in the other, in the other way. It's very easy. or well, the easiest explanation is that binary black hole. But we have not seen, nobody has seen any, uh, any uh, emission from that secondary black hole. So we may be able to see, because what, what's going to happen is that um, when the secondary black hole goes through the accretion disk of the prime of the primary, it may actually uh, capture some of the uh, matter in that accretion disk and form form some sort of a transient accretion or transient uh, blob or cloud of plasma following that black hole. Or maybe during that period we can actually see radio emission or emission in, in other brand, other bands uh, coming from the secondary. It's very speculative, I would say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The moment what we see is that again the uh, the morphology of the uh, uh, of the jet indicates that it might actually undergo a precession or some sort of a um, change in the direction of the outflow which uh, is most likely then caused by the presence of a secondary object but 
it's and it's I mean, I've got the picture of the of your observations behind me. And, you know, it doesn't look anything like the event horizon telescope it looks like a bunch of blurry orange and red blobs. Um, but it's far away. It is billions of light years away. Um, yes, I think that's it was like, I being like three plus billion light years away. Right. Yeah, you just think in terms of redshift, right? Or, or mega parsecs. So exactly. it is much far, further away. So we cannot sample or we cannot observe such close uh, or small linear scales as in the in the M87 or in our own yeah. uh, center of our own galaxy. So uh, for the event horizon telescope, the next step would, would be, however, to go to um, uh, objects other than these two objects that Event Horizon Telescopes have been able to observe. And nowadays, now we are actually preparing for uh, preparing a sample of nearby AGM we, where we can actually uh, come to a similar linear resolution as for the M87 or for Sagi Star. Yeah. And there are objects where you could do that. Unfortunately, that is not OJ287. Um, it's, there are other galaxies in which the uh, central black holes are massive enough and the galaxies are not uh, are close enough for us so that we would still be able to see not the event horizon scale but the scale of the of the shadow produced produced by the, by the black hole so radio te- space based radio telescopes feel like the an absolute natural fit for this they're easier and less they're sort of they're more resilient than something like James Webb, like, they're more sort of robust, I think you can put a bigger telescope into into space. And you can fine tune the distance and location of the telescope fairly easily in space compared to I guess, trying to deal with with the ground. If you were to purpose build a space based radio telescope, which I mean, since I mean, there aren't very many are there because I guess it works so well from the ground, no one has put a big effort into it. Why aren't there any big space? Why isn't there a a James Webb of radio space radio telescopes? Uh, Well, it's a difficult or interesting question, because there are two way or two reasons to go to space uh, in radio. One is to do these kind of measurements with like VLBI, like the type of measurements. But the, uh, the other reason is to, uh, to work in, in the areas of frequency space where uh, the Earth's atmosphere is not transparent. So this is, a lot of it is uh, some of the uh, low frequency observations are suffering not from transparency, but from ionospheric effects. So they will be better done even from the moon and there are plans to uh, mm-hmm. maybe to do that. And uh, at higher frequencies, at frequencies about above 100, 100 gigahertz or some um, uh, 1.5, 2 millimeters, 3 millimeters, um, there are progressively larger chunks of frequency domain become not transparent from for the for the telescopes on Earth. So you need to put them up mm. in space in order to be, be able to observe this thing. And uh, uh, but. Um, the trouble is there is that in order to get a sensible, a decent telescope, even working in the, in space and in, in radio, I mean, you need to call it. You need to put a lot of efforts um, to um, to maintain its operability, if you say, if you wish. Uh, and it was not easy. And also, there are many other competing competing. Uh, programs for the space uh, agencies so um, that's why the um, there was no some such as like James Webb type of the uh, mm-hmm. radio operations but things for instance if you think for CMB measurements the famous Planck satellites this is radio telescope mm-hmm. this is radio telescope. so all yeah, that's that, the point uh, yeah you could call that a, C- a James Webb of radio astronomy because it has it has provided tremendous advances in the uh, in cosmology. And so could I had never even thought about that. So could Planck 
which produce like the best view of the cosmic microwave background. It's out at the L two point, isn't it? Wasn't it? No. Or was it in Earth orbit? It wasn't. It was an orbit. I don't think it was an L two. Yeah. I okay. Don't... All right. I'll have to double check that. But but again, even just being in orbit gives you a little bit bigger of a, of a baseline. Now want to now want to look this up. But but would you know if they had said okay you can borrow Planck would would its its observation regime the wavelengths it can see the could you align that with work from the ground with the VLB etc to to make a baseline using Planck well in order to do that you have to put the measure on the telescope and you have to put the either a transmission uh, which would be fast enough to transmit down downlink the uh, the the data from a telescope or a big buffer in order to record this data and then transmit it later. So mm -hmm. VLBI applications are actually, as I said, they're very expensive in this in, in, in many aspects. Yeah. And uh, so that's why if the satellite has not been designed to do that beforehand, you so, cannot just co-observe with that. So I was right. It did go to L2. Okay. Yeah. yeah so there you go. So you can have a telescope with a baseline of one and a half million kilometers. Well, that's what you, oh, you actually saying exactly what is what is planned. This is the next the next uh, Russian telescope called Millimetron, and they do plan to put it on the L two, and uh, for two reasons. The major reason is, in fact, is what I said uh, before about the frequencies which are not accessible from the Earth. So they want to do a lot of uh, operations at, uh, at several hundred gigahertz for cosmological for uh, studies and for studies of molecular uh, species, molecular um, <clears throat> physics in, the, in our galaxy. But they also plan right from the start VOBI capabilities. And uh, we will try to get the uh, get the so-called interferometer uh, measurements, interferometric measurements, all the way to L2. This will hmm. be a, a, a tremendous step forward. Uh, we don't know if it's going to uh, be successful at all, because if you were talking now at, uh, about the resolution of 10 micro arc seconds, then if you put satellite at L2, point L2, you would get a resolution of 1 to 10 nano arc seconds. <laughs> And this is, if you if you want a comparison, if you're the a planet orbiting Alpha Centauri, so the star, the na neighboring star, um, eight light years away from us, you had a planet, and on that planet you had a football stadium. You would have seen a football stadium <laughs> on that planet. So if it was glow, if it was glowing in radio waves, you would have to set it on fire first. Yes. Right? Yeah. So, <laughs> right. Right. But but that's the kind of that's the kind of resolution that you could, you know, and I, I've I've looked into projects, ideas of like putting one telescope at the Earth Sun L4 point, one at the L5 point and then one at the L3 point. And right. so you'd have this giant equilateral triangle the size of the Earth's orbit, which would be able to, you know, they'd be able to communicate with each other and they'd be able to align themselves. So you could probably get to a point where where the the transmission is fairly closely aligned at a fairly long wavelength. Like, like once you go to space, I mean, it's interesting. Like if you're looking at very bright objects, you get just a ton of value by, by making a big baseline of just separating your telescope and in the radio, because you can use those, the computers after the fact, it makes life more convenient than, yes. than trying to do it in real time. Yes, but the brightness, brightness of is 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 a factor which works against us. We have to have something which is extremely compact, and in effect, and extremely bright. This is also a problem, for instance, with the uh, optical interferometry. They um, they cannot go to a very dim object. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They yeah, have to get more lights uh, in individual antennas or individual, sorry, individual telescopes to to get the score, get the um, interference detected and for us it's, it has been a limit and we have tried to see uh, well actually a discussion when before radio Astron was, was launched 
and even plant, there was a big discussion if you could actually, if it makes sense to put it as far as 300,000 kilometers. And many of the uh, scientists, they were just very skeptical and said, well, we'll not detect anything because everything has to be resolved out. There's mm -hmm. nothing, 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 no structure so compact, 10 uh, micro arc seconds. Now we have the same doubts or the same fears about nano arc seconds, but I'm not sure it's going yeah. to happen. Yeah. Probably we'll get, we'll be successful at some point. So uh, there would be sort of a limit. And so, so I guess people had already thought that the limit was was reached that that you would just this limit between looking at very bright objects and looking at very using a very large baseline like the two are working against itself and so at a certain point you may have a telescope the size of the earth's orbit but there's nothing bright enough to look at to be able to reveal anything you know you could see an ant in a football stadium in Alpha Centauri, but there's just no bright enough ants out there to be able to to show them off. But that's, that's yeah. a risk. Yeah, yeah. And so do you think that there is sort of a a limit where you can sort of go like, we, we've done all we can with with the baseline. And now the only thing that we can do now is make the individual telescopes bigger. Are we do you feel like we're sort of at that level? I mean, I guess I feel like you proved it with these observations and said, no, no, we can go all the way to the orbit of the moon and still image an object with a baseline right. that big. So the limit is, is a no, is a no. We, we do not know when we actually will fail with this, with this method. It is, and it, what makes it in some, in some ways very, very much interesting because you're really pushing for something that which is uh, um, a unknown and b cannot be really predicted because as i said it's 10 20 years ago people would say no 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 it's just even the moon is too far and it's going to be it's going to be a failure we're not going to be detecting anything but we also on on the way to this uh, new discoveries and new detections we'll also have to improve a lot of um, other aspects of measurements for instance if Phase stability, the sensitivity band bandwidth of the measurements is also a very important factor because the the broader the bandwidth which is recorded at the individual telescope, the better sensitivity we have, and we can actually then detect even uh, much weaker emission because weak, weak and bright is not necessarily um, uh, the same thing. Or weak and dim, it could be very bright because it's very compact, but because of the same thing, because it's very compact, there's not enough surface to make it to make it to make it strong. Or so it's going to be weak but very bright emission, and uh, that's what we're going to be measuring if with this telescope uh, millimeter in in L2 when it comes. Um, we're looking for for this kind of detections for something which is basically a grain of salt, but it's very bright grain of salt somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's the that's the trick. Um, uh, and so this, um, you know, you talk about the, the, the Russian space telescope that's that's due for launch. Uh, and th they had a previous telescope and they've actually they've had a line of these space based radio telescopes. They put it they've actually I don't think people are, are familiar, but the Russians have done quite a few space telescopes. Uh, they launched one fairly recently, um, an X-ray right. telescope. X-ray telescope, yeah. Yeah. Well, if we're talking about space VLBI, uh, the whole history of space VLBI is essentially one and a half missions. <laughs> was um, the first attempt was done in 1985, and then they used a commercial uh, TV relay satellite, TDRSS. Uh, and it's, it was one of this one of the situations where you could actually do VLBI with a satellite which was not designed to do VLBI at all. So the first attempt to create sort of interferometer with an antenna on Earth and another antenna in space was 1985 with that commercial setting. They just made a proof of concept measurements yeah. that it should, you can actually detect uh, or measure interference pattern. And then uh, there were many projects which started by different parts of the astronomical community who tried to, uh, to uh, 
who try to push them through, through NASA, through ESA, through different agencies. Radio Astro started at about that that time in 19, late, actually, the whole the first idea was um, late 70s, but it really started sometimes uh, uh, mid, mid 80s. And um, several other projects went to some sort of design studies or, or uh, some, some preparation, preparative studies, and they were shut down by different agencies and never got to, uh, to a point of being realized. But then there was a second project it was a Japanese um, uh, undertaking that's called VSOP, uh, VOBI Space Observatory Program, which started formally after Radio Astra, but on, on the way has overtaken it and was launched in 1997. And that's when we actually first made images with this in this space VOBI mode. That satellite was on an orbit which was much closer. It's actually 36,000 kilometers uh diameter proven by a factor of three so um it's the same as if you just go to a three times higher frequency mm -hmm. and you get the same improvement of resolution and people were saying it's maybe useless to do that and again the skeptics were saying well but it's about as much as much as we can so radio astron when it flies to three hundred thousand, will just be a waste of time so we'll find out Radio Astron was the second and so far the last space will be I mission. So now the the um there's a Dutch collaboration with the Chinese on the on a Chinese the the Chinese spacecraft that's acting like a relay for the the oh man, I forget which one, the Chang of four on the far side of the moon, the rover, and there's a Dutch radio telescope radio right on that spacecraft, which has been doing some observations, sort of similar to sort of pathfinding stuff for like what they'll do with the square kilometer array. Um, but, but this is that's the one that, when, that does low frequency measurements. Yeah, yeah, uh, low far. Yeah, yeah, it was it's just not well, um, it does in a single dish on some it's a self sustained uh, instrument, there's no VLBI attempt uh, capabilities but it does measurements again at uh, frequencies which which suffer a lot from the um, ionospheric problems on earth so yeah, and that's a precursor possible precursor to some uh, attempts to put this low frequency arrays or instruments on the uh, on the moon surface right now but that's interesting right because that's a collaboration between the European Space Agency and the Chinese Space Agency on, on this one. And the Chinese have demonstrated a serious commitment to radio astronomy. They've built the largest uh, single dish telescope in the world with fast. They're building the largest steerable radio telescope. They do have plans to build a space based radio observatory, I believe I might be wrong. They're like their ver and and they're also got a, a version. They're looking at uh, potentially some uh, space based gravitational waves as well. So, are are the Chinese working on any telescopes that will work well for for the the research that you're doing? Well, China is booming, and we we have okay. Apart from space VOBI, our, our daily uh, bread and butter is the ground array ground VOBI. And of course, the Chinese antennas have been long since incorporated into this kind of networks. There is a global network of telescopes. One part of it is in, in the US, it's a VLBA, Very Long Baseline Array. Uh, another network is called European VLBI Network. And although the name says European, the antennas in that network go from South Africa to China, uh, Russia, and Korea. And sometimes Australians are also co-observing. So this is actually a real global community. Mm -hmm. And these uh, efforts in, in recent times are very impressive. With a lot of uh, new receivers and new antennas working in the OBI mode of operation. And uh, they do plan or have been planning uh, for some space VOBI mission, which would be essentially a, a successor of the SOP of the Japanese mission was similar to that, except one of the new revolutionary ideas was to put two antennas in space. So for the first time, we would get interferometric experiments between two orbiting antennas. That was not has not been done before, so we do not know how it works as well. That's amazing. Yeah. 
Um, unfortunately, this was there was also discussion about seven years ago when, when we were going to Beijing for for these discussions, and uh, unfortunately, this project seems to be uh, put on hold for the moment. So we because of the lunar effort, I presume, or many other um, efforts which which also require uh, investments and resources in China, and uh, this can this space VLBI project has been uh, at the moment somewhere on the uh, on the back track. That, that's unfortunate, but I wouldn't be surprised that, you know, that specifically out of China, they've been building so much expertise in radio astronomy. I mean, they're, they're now the pulsar finders of the world. And a lot of the really interesting radio papers that I, that I look at are being done with the fast telescope, they're donating enormous amounts of time on the fast telescope for researchers who, who want to, to be able to do this, this kind of work. Do you think that there might be like a classified military telescope out there that is observing the Earth that would do what you need? Do you think? There's plenty of classified military telescopes because uh, VLBI and this kind of science is tremendously relevant for all kinds of military purposes. The, uh, the missiles flying so precisely only because of the VLBI measurements, the um, the um, uh, GPS satellites, they need to be uh, corrected. The orbital positions and their ephemeris have, has to be have to be corrected once every week uh, in order to maintain stability. And these corrections are done with with the help of VLBI measurements. VLBI provides the most accurate uh, coordinate system and the most accurate information about the Earth rotation parameters. And those are needed for multitude of purposes. And military are doing it all over the world for themselves. And they, of course, do not share their no, telescopes. No, no, I know. But I wonder, like, if you could just say, could I please just borrow? I just need you to make these observations. Don't tell me how you did it. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, like, do you think that telescope exists? Like, do you think the perfect radio telescope for your purposes is out, is out there right now. It just happens to be pointed at the Earth as opposed to in the other direction. No, no, no. They, they, they do it from Earth. I'm sorry. I just misunderstood your question. There's no there's no need to do that from space. Oh, okay. So, so there, are, there are no space-based military no, no, telescopes no. that are pointed at the no, Earth. No, no okay. I was no. trying to think of a... That's, a, that's useless. Then it's a UV... Um, optical, even gamma, that's more, much more relevant for the military. No, right. So. Okay. All right. All right. Well, then, then, then never mind that. So I guess I want to talk about the future then of of this field, because it's not, it doesn't get the same kind of press, doesn't get the same kind of excitement as pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope. But, but the, the research it gives is absolutely groundbreaking and fundamental. And I think we finally got the public getting excited with the Event Horizon Telescope, with this finally seeing this picture of a black hole. What do you see as the future of of interferometry, radio interferometry, in telling us more about the universe? Um, well, there's plenty of interesting things, but the, but at the moment, at the moment. Studies of black holes and, and actually proving the uh, the true existence of black hole, which is which has not been uh, contrary to to the popular presentation, it is there is still a debate. There are still discussions going on about the possible alternative explanation for 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 the observations that we uh, that we have, and all of the uh, evidence for for black hole is um, to some extent circumstantial or could be circumvented by alternative explanations. And this, these discussions are still going on. And the next next step for the event horizon for uh, radio interferometric measurements, if you wish, is to find uh, definitive measurements uh, that would say that we do have that canonical black hole which with singularity and the event horizon formed uh, around it, or there's something more exotic in, in place of that singularity. And any type of more exotic explanation, if we find an evidence that there's, there's such, a, such an exotic body um, exists, it would be, a, a, would be a, a, a tremendous breakthrough because it would actually 
uh, would require change of many paradigms in, in physics. First of all, the general relativity uh, thing and uh, quantum mechanics, possibly because because anything that prevents the collapse to into singularity has to act with some forces which we do not understand or know at, about the, at this moment. So this is uh, one of the uh, very exciting uh, mm -hmm. tasks Deferometry. Many others, for instance, with the um, with regard to measuring uh, accurate distances to uh, nearby galaxies, measuring proper motions and parallaxes of, of of those galaxies, have a lots of cosmological applications, applications to understanding uh, what's going on with our with our universe. And for instance, one of the tasks is uh, I'm sure you've. You've heard about this tension between the um, Hubble constant measurements done for nearby objects and for more distant objects. So the, the, the measurements do not agree with each other. And one of the best way to uh, to test this is to measure uh, distances to nearby galaxies with much more uh, much better precision. And we we should be able to do that with the next generation interferometric measurements we're actually trying to uh, to instigate such a such a problem and, does, so, and this, does that give you a very like direct accurate measurement uh yes because again at this micro seconds precision accuracy so if you do this 10 micro seconds if you start if you become capable of doing astrometry at this 10 micro seconds you could actually measure parallaxes and proper motions of, wow. of near okay. galaxies directly and that that will tell you, that will give you right. absolute so dead on measure of right. distance of objects. And, and so, sorry, just to clarify this, using astrometry, this is the same method that the Gaia spacecraft uses to measure the distance to various stars. Right. But you're doing this to whole other galaxies because your baseline yeah. is so accurate, and then you're getting you're getting the exact distance to the galaxy. You're losing a lot of the Right now, dis the distance ladder is such fuzzy measurements all the way up the, the ladder, and they all depend on lower and lower rungs. So to be able to to image the heart of a galaxy and right. know its precise distance would be, again, a game changer and, and hopefully resolve the Hubble, the crisis in cosmology. No, we we cannot, we have, we, we're not doing it yet. Right. That's, that's, this is the plan. This is the, uh, one of the, actually, one of the uh, uh, plan, developments for this um, event horizon telescope and for similar activities at the uh, millimeter VLBI front is the potential astrometric measurements at 10 micro seconds accuracy. That's what we are, uh, are trying to to achieve or to reach within the next decade, I would say, if we feel lucky. And it would be the same thing. You would you would you would measure the angle to your galaxy at one part of the year, and then six months later, do another observation, and then see how much the right. galaxy jumps back and forth compared to the background. That, and also, uh, we will also see the effect of uh, motion of our own galaxy, galaxy with respect to. Right. So, our galaxy moves with about four or five hundred kilometers per second with respect to uh, nearby galaxies. So. This, this will be what is called what's called the um, uh, secular parallax, which was or CMB parallax, because we we can measure the velocity vector of our own galaxy uh, with respect to the CMB reference frame, reference frame of cosmic microwave background, and that velocity will also cause the uh, change of position of the nearby objects, and we would be able to detect that. So this is some something which is which is going to be um, quite revolutionary. It re requires a new technology to be applied to for VLBI measurements. Yes, but we hope that this technology will be successful. And so, sorry, just to make sure I understand this correctly, like like we know we're surrounded by the cosmic microwave background. This is that first light that was left that was emitted, essentially when light could finally escape into the universe, and we know that the galaxy is shifting in this entire universe and we could actually measure our motion compared to the cosmic microwave background as sort of like a 
an absolute point in the in the universe. Although obviously, you know, every every second that goes by, we're looking at a different version of the cosmic microwave background. But in general, we could measure our drift through the universe. Right. Right, and then again, you, since since you have this accuracy of a uh, few dozens of uh, micro arc seconds, you can start change, measuring or detecting the relative change of the position between different galaxies because of these peculiar motions of those galaxies with respect to each other. And uh, this is one of the interesting perspective for for the VOBI, not necessarily space VOBI. This is ground ground mm -hmm, measurement. Mm -hmm. Space VOBI is mostly physics. It's very difficult to uh, to make astrometric measurements with space VOBI uh, apparatus. But ground array view, ground VOBI uh, measurements they provide very much, very accurate astrometric information. And I mean, there is the I guess the U.S. has announced as part of the decadal survey they're going to be doing a much bigger version of the very line, very large baseline array, like one that's going to have dozens of, of telescopes spread or 200 telescopes spread across all of North America. Um, you're probably talking about the EVLA. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, the next generation. Of, right. That's the NGVLA. That's what the, uh, this is true. And that's going to be uh, an, an impressive instrument because if you, if you wish, there's going to be effectively, essentially a Hubble telescope quality of imaging images, but in the radio domain. So all you say that the, uh, the public has been much more enchanted by, by the Hubble images as by the radio images. That's the uh, deficiency of interferometric uh, image restoration. Yeah. And that deficiency becomes smaller and smaller the more antennas you combine together. So with NGVLA, you, probably, you will have to have uh, quality of images similar to Hubble. In fact, the, um, the South African telescope, the one of the SKA precursors, Meerkat, Mm -hmm. It's just an absolutely stunning image in the center of our galaxy. Yes. Of the imaging that comes. It is funny. I think you're exactly right that that the like it used to be that a radio image was a couple of dots, a couple of blobs, because the the detector is is a very is works in a very different way from the way a, an optical telescope does. But when you look at that image from the meerkat of the center of the of the galaxy it looks like a weird photograph from hubble and yet right. it's a it's a radio i think you're exactly right that that all that we needed for radio astronomy to be as exciting as visible is just better radio telescopes and it sounds like we're there or we're about to be there with the square right. kilometer array and, and others, suddenly we're going to have images that look as as incredible. It's a fascinating field of work. I'm really excited at the progress. And I hope that this gives people a better understanding of just what this underlying technology is and, and what it's for. If people want to follow your work, what is the best way to to keep tracks of, of what you guys are working on? Well, it's difficult to say. <laughs> Ar archive, <laughs> archive, archive for sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm not. I'm not prepared to answer that question. I don't know what's. The, we, well, we have we have public releases and we have public relation offices. And all. You go to NRAO website. You go to the MPI websites. MPIFR.de. Uh, you will get this. Uh, all kinds of public information or popular popular science information or news distributed or presented um, quite promptly after after anything interesting has been discovered or reported. Yeah, so that's yeah. Fantastic. All right. Well, uh, Andre, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today and answering all of my questions. I really appreciate it. And again, good thank luck you. with your with your observations and getting that that giant space radio telescope to join the array. I can't wait. Okay. And right. best of luck with your efforts.